Good morning, good evening to all of you. Welcome to the third webinar of the Infectious Disease Series hosted by the Euroimmune Academy. My name is Maite Savalza and I am the Scientific Affairs Manager at Euroimmune US. Our speaker today is Dr. Ellie Thiel from Mayo Clinic, and we are discussing tick-borne diseases and how to detect them. Similar to previous webinars, we will start with a presentation from our speaker, and towards the end, we will also have a panel discussion. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box on your screen and we will ask them to the speaker in the Q&A section. Any unanswered questions will be addressed via email. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Ellie Thiel. Dr. Ellie Thiel received her PhD in medical microbiology and immunology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and subsequently completed a clinical microbiology fellowship at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Thiel is certified by the American Board of Medical Microbiology and is currently the Director of Infectious Diseases Serology Laboratory at Mayo Clinic. Her research interests include development and evaluation of novel methods for antibody and antigen detection as diagnostics, specifically for fungal infections and vector-borne diseases. Dr. Thiel also leads an international laboratory outreach initiative in Belize. This initiative is focused on increasing the in-country diagnostic testing capacity for vector bone diseases and on enhancing the current quality assurance, quality control practices in clinical laboratories throughout the country. Welcome, Dr. Thiel. I will pass it over to you to begin your presentation. Great. Thank you, Dr. Sabalza, for the introduction and for the invitation to present here today on tick-borne infections. Um, so there's a lot that one could get into when it comes to tick-borne diseases, but for today, I'll start by reviewing some of the tick bases with a focus on North America, and then I'll transition to some case-based presentations um, and discuss updates to Lyme disease diagnostics and review a few of the emerging and more common tick-borne infections in North America and how to best detect them. Uh, so before getting into the talk, these are my relevant um, financial and research disclosures. Um, and so with that, uh, before getting into the actual tick-borne pathogens, I think it's important to really be familiar with the vectors that they are spread by. Um, so generally speaking, there are two major families of ticks, the hard body ticks, of which there are many different genera, although in North America, there are four major ones um, that we think about that are um, clinically significant, including, as you see here, exodes, dermacenter, amblyoma, and rhipocephalus. And then there's the, the soft body ticks, of which there's really one primary genre that um, we think about as, as being associated with human infections, and that's the Ornithodoros um, genus. Morphologically, these two tick families are <clears throat> somewhat straightforward generally to differentiate, especially when observing them from the dorsal side. You can clearly see that the head or the capitulum of the hard tick is quite prominent and visible, whereas it's um, more so hidden underneath that dorsal surface of the soft body ticks. And so um, also hard ticks have this uh, dorsal um, shield or, or scutum, uh, which is absent in the soft body ticks. So the tick uh, life cycles do vary uh, somewhat, but if we focus on just the exodes species hard ticks, they have four life cycle um, stages that take about two years to complete, starting with the hatching of larvae in the spring of year one. Um, and then while the majority of tick-borne pathogens are not transmitted vertically from the um, female tick to the larva, this sort of vertical transmission does occur for um, two pathogens that we think about, 
uh, that are transmitted by Ixodi species ticks, and those include uh, Powassan virus and Borrelia miyamotoi, which, which we'll talk about. Um, and essentially what that means is that the larva is born ready to infect animals as soon as it takes its first blood meal. After hatching, though, uh, the larva will feed typically on small mammals like mice uh, during the, the summer months, at which point they'll become infected with any number of possible pathogens that are harbored by these environmental um, reservoirs, and then they'll lie dormant during the fall and winter months. So then during the spring of year two, the larva will molt into nymphs, which will then feed on larger animals, including um, humans. And it's these nymphs that are really responsible for the majority of human infections since they're very tiny and uh, very easy to be missed. Uh, in fact, um, for comparison, they're about the size of a poppy seed, which this bagel uh, nicely shows. And then during the fall of that second year, the nymphs will molt into adults, which will feed on deer um, and then mate. And the females will lay eggs, continuing the life cycle into the next year. So as I mentioned earlier, there are many different types of hard ticks in the U.S. and they transmit a variety of different pathogens, which I thought I'd quickly review, starting with the brown dog tick, which is found throughout the United States, um, as you can see here. And it's primarily associated with transmission of rickettsia rickettsia, the causative agent of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. The next tick to consider is the American dog tick or the wood tick, which is primarily found in the eastern half of the U.S. as well as in California. It too transmits rickettsia as well as a small number or it's associated with a small number of Francisella tularensis cases as well. The Rocky Mountain wood tick found primarily in the Rocky Mountain regions likewise transmits rickettsia and tularemia, but also it transmits an emerging tick-borne virus, Colorado tick fever virus, of which there have been about 80 or so cases reported between 2002 and 2012. And the bite of this particular tick has been associated with causing tick paralysis, which can be quickly reversed following removal of the tick itself. The next tick we'll uh, mention is the lone star tick, so-called because of that white spot in the, in the middle of its scutum. And it's found primarily in the southeastern U.S. and is associated with transmission of Francisella tularensis, a variety of Ehrlichia species. The bite of this tick is also um, uh, the cause of southern tick-associated rash illness, or STARI, the precise cause of which has not fully been um, identified as of yet. But this tick is also the vector for a number of emerging uh, viruses, including Heartland virus, Bourbon virus, and to top it all off, this is the tick whose bite is associated with stimulating meat allergies. Uh, I won't go into the details, but very um, briefly re with respect to this meat allergy during the bite, alpha-gal, which is a carbohydrate from the tick, is released into the body, which then stimulates an IgE-mediated allergic reaction, which can be potentially quite severe since alpha-gal is found on cells, um, on many cells and tissues of all, uh, all mammals. And then the final two ticks um, are both within the same Ixodes genus, Ixodes genus, excuse me, which is perhaps the most famous or infamous of the of the tick um, uh, species. They're also referred at, referred to as the black legged or um, or the deer ticks. They're found in the eastern and Midwest U.S. as well as in the Pacific Coast. Uh, and the reason they're best known is because they transmit a variety of different pathogens, starting, of course, with uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, the causative agent of Lyme disease. They also transmit Babesia species, Anaplasma phagocytophilum, Borrelia miyamotoi, um, and then also they are known to transmit Powassan virus, as well as um, the more recently described um, Ehrlichia species found primarily in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Uh, so that's Ehrlichia muris oclarensis. So all told, hard ticks transmit at least 12 known different uh, and different human pathogens.
So the last tick I want to just mention is the ornithodoros soft tick, which is associated with transmission of relapsing fever Borrelia species, primarily including Borrelia hermsii and uh, Borrelia parkeri, amongst others. And you can see on the map to the left where most of these cases are found in the U.S. Um, uh, and it kind of also gives you a sense of where the, this uh, particular tick, uh, um, these particular tick species are also found. So these um, ticks differ somewhat from your typical hard ticks because their bites are actually fairly brief, less than 30 minutes, compared to exodi species ticks, for example, which will which can latch on for um, a day or longer unless they're removed sooner. They also primarily live in rodent burrows and caves rather than being free in the vegetation like hard ticks and um, they can live for 10 years or, or longer, uh, which as we reviewed is not actually uh, quite the case for, for hard ticks. So there, there's some key differences there to be um, cognizant of. All right, so with that kind of whirlwind tour of ticks and the pathogens that they carry, we'll move on um, and take a deeper dive into a few of these pathogens and talk about the preferred diagnostics that we use to uh, detect these in, in um, infected patients. So getting right into our first case, this was or is a 61 year old male who presented to the emergency department in June with a one month history of progressive blurry vision and pain in his right eye. He also had severe upper back pain and right arm radiculopathy. Um, he'd reported some subacute headaches, and then on the day of presentation, he developed acute onset right-sided peripheral um, uh, facial nerve palsy. And because of all of these symptoms, he was immediately admitted to our neurology service where they got additional history, including that he is single, he lives in Minnesota, so no notable travel. He worked in a, a food processing plant but he also does some on the side landscaping work. And then towards the end of his history, almost kind of as an afterthought, he added that he'd removed about 34 ticks from his body in early May after a landscaping project. Uh, and so because of that exposure at the time, he was prescribed doxycycline, uh, but he'd only completed three of the 14 uh, recommended days. So on admission, the patient had a lumbar puncture performed. Um, I'm only showing you his abnormal CSF findings, which as you can see, included elevated protein and a lymphocytic pleocytosis. I won't go through the details of his ID workup, but you can see a list of all the negative cultures, PCRs, and serology studies that were done on his CSF, which notably included a negative PCR result for Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, all the blood testing, including um, cultures, were similarly negative. And in fact, the only non-negative result for this patient was his Lyme disease serology, excuse me, um, on serum, which was performed using the standard two-tiered testing algorithm um, at the time. So just a reminder, the standard two-tier testing algorithm for Lyme disease first starts with an EIA screen, which if negative should prompt providers to consider an alternative diagnosis, or if the patient presents early following exposure, uh, the provider um, could collect and test a convalescent sample. If, however, the screening assay is reactive, then a second test using a Western blot or an immunoblot is um, required to look for specific IgM and IgG class antibodies to Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, and again, for the IgM blot to be considered positive, we need to see the presence of specific antibodies to at least two out of a possible three Borrelia antigens. Um, and then for the IgG blot to be considered positive, we need to see reactivity at at least five out of a possible 10 antigens on the blot. Um, and as we'll talk about in a little bit, there's now an alternative algorithm that can be used, the modified two-tier uh, testing algorithm, but again, we'll cover that shortly. 
So getting back to the patient, as you can see in this table, he again was positive by the Lyme screening um, ELISA and his supplemental IgM and IgG immunoblots were also positive with three and five bands respectively. So the lab got a call um, from the provider that um, basically said, you know, in light of this patient's exposure and serum Lyme serology results, we're convinced that he has neuroinvasive Lyme disease, but the CSF PCR is negative for Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, you know, why is the PCR negative and is there another way that we can confirm a neuroinvasive infection? So before going further, a quick refresher on Lyme and more specifically neuroinvasive Lyme disease. Um, so as you are likely aware, Lyme disease is caused by infection with different members of the Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto um, complex, of which there are over 15 different species, although only about seven or so have been associated with human disease. Um, and of those, Borrelia burgdorferi uh, sensu stricto is actually the most common agent in, in North America. All of these agents, though, are transmitted by Ixodes species ticks. And although, um, at least in the United States, while only 36,000 cases are reported annually to the CDC, it's um, estimated or considered that this is a gross underestimate of the true number inf of infections that occur annually, which is likely closer to 300,000 or more. From a laboratory perspective, um, which is perhaps more astonishing, we perform over three and a half million tests every year on two, roughly two and a half million samples at the cost of almost half a billion dollars, which if you think about it is really quite a staggering statistic. Um, all that being said, Lyme disease can progress through multiple different stages with neuroinvasive Lyme um, able to affect both the peripheral or the central nervous system, um, or both of them. And um, the resulting um, manifestations um, can be uh, quite, quite severe, and you can see them uh, listed here, um, including causing cranial neuritis, uh, radiculoneuritis, uh, plexopathies, um, CNS involvement can lead to meningitis, uh, myelitis, as, and typically we'll see a lymphocytic uh, pleocytosis in, in the spinal fluid. Um, and you'll remember that our patient actually had uh, all three um, uh, of these uh, key manifestations. Importantly, though, despite these common features, um, they're still nonspecific. And as a result, the current Lyme disease IDSA guidelines indicate that if a patient has one or more of the above symptoms alongside appropriate epidemiologic exposure, um, further testing should be considered. So how do we test for neuroinvasive Lyme disease? Well, we could try to culture the spirochete from spinal fluid, but less than 10% of CSF cultures are typically positive in these cases, and culture is really no longer performed in hospitals or um, clinical laboratories. So that's really not an option. Alternatively, as was done in this case, PCR for Borrelia burgdorferi can be performed in spinal, uh, spinal fluid, um, however, all of the PCR assays for Lyme are currently laboratory developed tests and as such they can really vary in their performance characteristics. And in general, PCR for Borrelia uh, burgdorferi is fairly poor for most uh, specimen types. So as you can see here, sensitivity in synovial fluid and from erythema migrans tissue biopsies, PCR sensitivity is, is okay, uh, up to about 77 or so percent. Uh, but sensitivity in spinal fluid and in blood is quite low. Uh, median ranges anywhere from 18 to 22 percent. And that's primarily due to the fact that this organism just causes a fairly low bacterial burden um, in the human host. So PCR really is not the preferred um, uh, method uh, either. And so that leaves us with serology, uh, which is actually the recommended approach for diagnosis of neuroinvasive Lyme disease. However, there's multiple different types of serologic assays for Lyme, so the question becomes, what is really the most appropriate when it comes to a neuroinvasive disease? Um, so our patient started by having his spinal fluid tested using the standard two-tier testing algorithm that was done on serum. And as you can see here, his CSF was positive by the screening ELISA and also had uh, banding um, uh, antibodies detected on the IgM and the IgG immunoblot. 
Um, but we don't actually um, report interpretations because the standard two-tier testing algorithm was developed for evaluation of serum, uh, not CSF, which may differ uh, between the two compartments. Also, if you compare the antibodies detected in spinal fluid to the ones that we detected in serum, you'll note that they are uh, really the same. So the question then becomes, are these antibodies present in the spinal fluid due to true intrathecal antibody synthesis, or is it are they there due to just passive diffusion um, of antibodies from serum across the blood-brain barrier into the spinal fluid? So to answer that question, multiple international and U.S. infectious um, disease organizations, including the IDSA and the European Federation uh, Neurologic Society, recommend performing a Lyme disease antibody index test, which can help differentiate between these two scenarios. So the antibody index is essentially a ratio of um, antiborrelia-specific antibodies in the CSF to serum, uh, normalized to total IgG antibodies in spinal fluid and serum. And so you can kind of see what this basically generic equation looks like here um, to help you kind of visualize that. However, there is a lot more math uh, that goes into um, calculating this ratio, which I won't go into today, uh, but it takes into account things like CSF turnover and normal antibody diffusion rates and so on and so forth. Ultimately, though, we do get a ratio value, and if that is greater than 1.6, it's interpreted to mean um, that the level of Borrelia-specific antibodies in spinal fluid are higher than those in serum, which is indicative of intrathecal synthesis and neuroinvasive uh, disease. And so when it comes to performance characteristics for Lyme antibody indices in particular, sensitivity largely depends on when the patient presents clinically. So um, one study showed that in patients with less than six weeks of symptoms, sensitivity ranges from roughly 70 to 90 percent, whereas in ind individuals with more than six weeks of symptoms, sensitivity of an AI approach um, method approaches about 100% with similar specificity <clears throat> around 95%. There's some caveats to keep in mind, though, uh, with the Lyme antibody index, including that it will be, um, it can remain positive for a long period of time after disease resolution um, and treatment, even beyond six months. So we really cannot use this approach as a test of cure. Um, additionally, cross-reactivity can occur with other infections, most notably neurosyphilis. Um, uh, so results really need to be interpreted alongside clinical presentation and exposure risk. So getting back to our case, around the time of his presentation, we had just finished validation of our Lyme antibody index assay, and so we decided to test this patient using it. Um, and lo and behold, his Lyme AI was quite high at 23.5, so he was really uh, nicely positive above that 1.6 cutoff. So he was officially diagnosed with neuroinvasive Lyme disease. Um, he was treated and made a complete, recover complete recovery within about two months. So just um, uh, wanted to share with you our positivity rate since going live with this assay. Um, and you can see that we see nice peaks uh, during kind of the July, August month timeframe of, of every year with the exception of the uh, 2020 COVID year. Um, and, you know, we see anywhere from about a two to 5% positivity rate. So this is really not an uncommon uh, manifestation of, of Lyme disease in, in North America. So that was neuroborreliosis, but I did want to take a step back and talk about what's new in the diagnosis of regular Lyme disease. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, since 1994, the diagnosis of Lyme has been based on the standard two-tier testing algorithm, which we reviewed already. However, this really suffers from a number of limitations, including the issue of low sensitivity, particularly during the first one to two weeks after infection, um, ranging anywhere from 35 to 60 percent, uh, depending on, this, uh, on the study, and that's primarily driven by the low sensitivity of immunoblots in general. Also challenging is how immunoblots are interpreted, whether bands are visualized as present or absent by a tech or an instrument. Um, and then there have been concerns over the specificity of some of those uh, uh, Borrelia antigens that are included on the blots. 
but uh, that was really the best option we had at the time and for the last 25 years or so until about 2019 when the FDA cleared uh, the first um, or multiple EIAs, I should say, to be used as part of a modified two-tier testing algorithm, which I think has really been a historic event in the field. So what is this modified algorithm? Um, well, the most important takeaway is that immunoblots are not used uh, whatsoever. The modified algorithm still has two tiers. However, both of them involve EIAs or chemiluminescent based immunoassays, which importantly differ in the antigens used um, that are used to make them. So there's a number of different um, or many different assays that have now received FDA clearance to be used as part of a modified algorithm and there's different versions. Um, so I'm just showing you some of the versions that we looked at in, in our lab where um, the first tier is based on detection of total antibodies against a VLSC Pepsi 10 antigen. Um, if it's negative, you know, we're done testing. If that uh, first tier uh, EIA is reactive, uh, you would then go on to do second tier EIA testing, looking for antibodies against whole cell sonicate material. Um, and the algorithm can use either a single EIA looking for total antibodies against whole cell sonicate material or separate IgM and IgG assays. Um, and importantly, if either one or both of those are positive, the patient would be considered as positive for, um, for Lyme disease. Uh, with respect to performance characteristics of modified versus standard, uh, versus a standard algorithm, um, the modified algorithms across studies seem to provide higher sensitivity for detection of Borrelia antibodies, particularly during the early stage of infection. Um, so as you can see here in patients with erythema migraines, multiple studies have now shown that the, the modified algorithms are significantly more sensitive by about 10 to 20 percent as compared to the standard algorithm in acutely infected patients. Sensitivity at later stages of Lyme disease, on the other hand, is about equivalent between the algorithms. But because of that higher sensitivity early on, the overall sensitivity for these algorithms is also higher. With respect to specificity, on the other hand, um, that's really remained unchanged between the modified and the standard algorithm, which is susceptible kind of to the same causes of cross-reactivity as a standard algorithm, including in patients with EBV mononucleosis, um, syphilis, multiple sclerosis, and so on. So to finish up, I just wanted to uh, talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of using a modified algorithm, um, which when it comes to advantages, in addition to the increased sensitivity, this modified version um, allows for detection of antibodies to a wider range of Lyme-causing Borrelia species because the immunoblots were really specific for detection of antibodies to Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto alone. Um, the modified algorithm may be somewhat less expensive than the standard algorithm. It also allows for smaller labs to now perform both tiers of testing on site rather than potentially sending out to reference labs. So that leads to a faster turnaround time. Um, and then I anticipate that in general, there'll be less confusion around result interpretation as there's no more uh, banding patterns to really look at. With respect to disadvantages, um, remember that sensitivity of the modified algorithm is still imperfect during early disease and a re negative result would not rule out uh, infection. Also, given that we now only have qualitative results, we cannot monitor an IgG antibody expansion as we were with the uh, immunoblots. Um, there's um, also the, the standard algorithm like the standard algorithm, the modified algorithm cannot be used to monitor response to therapy um, as it will remain positive, um, similar to the standard algorithm. Um, and um, we, we will still have a difficult time trying to diagnose reinfections using the modified algorithm as well. So that was really a summary of um, Lyme disease diagnostics. Um, but for the rest of the talk, I thought we would talk about non-Lyme disease tick-borne infections, of which there are quite a few.
So starting um, with this case, this involves a 54 year old male who presented with a five day history of fevers and chills following a camping trip to um, upstate New, uh, New York a few weeks back. He also reported a severe headache and kind of a general arthralgia. There was no observed rash, and although he did not pull off any attach, attach ticks, he did note that there were a number of, um, of them that had crawled on him. His general labs showed thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, and elevated liver transaminases. Uh, blood smears and blood cultures were done and were all negative. A spinal fluid sample was collected, um, interestingly, uh, but was found to be entirely normal. Um, and then tick-borne pathogen testing was done uh, for common pathogens, uh, both acutely at the time of presentation and then two weeks later, um, but they were ultimately negative. However, an astute clinician had also ordered a Borrelia miyamotoi PCR on whole blood, given his presentation and exposure risk, uh, which although delayed because it was a send out test, did return as positive about four days after the patient initially presented. So before diving into this particular pathogen, a quick review of Borrelia phylogeny, I think is in order because there are some taxonomic um, changes that have been proposed specifically to split up the original genus Borrelia into Borrelia species, which make up the relapsing fever clade um, and, and introduction of a potentially a new genus Borreliella, Borreliella, which would encompass agents causing Lyme disease. So interestingly, Borrelia miyamotoi genetically falls within the um, relapsing fever clade. However, it is transmitted by um, exodes species ticks, whereas the relapsing fever pathogens are transmitted by the Ornithodora soft species ticks. Also, as we'll talk about, Borrelia miyamotoi does not cause classic relapsing fever uh, clinic, uh, a classic relapsing fever clinical syndrome, uh, but rather more of a prolonged uh, fever. Um, so it's a pathogen I think of that kind of straddles these um, these two clades of organisms. So this more um, recently described tick-borne pathogen was first identified in 1995 in Exodes ticks in Japan, with the first actual case detected in 2011 in Russia. Uh, and only one year later in 2012, uh, we had our first confirmed case here in North America. So Borrelia miyamotoi does have some features similar to Borrelia burgdorferi, including the fact that, again, it's transmitted by the same tick vector um, and um, does have a ge generally similar uh, geographic distribution. It also shares multiple immunogenic antigens or epitopes uh, with Lyme disease Borrelia species, and we will see cross-reactivity from antibodies to this pathogen on our Lyme disease um, tests, and I'll touch on that in a moment. There are a number of key differences, though, as well, including the fact that Borrelia miyamotoi expresses the GLP-Q gene, which is harbored by all relapsing fever Borrelia, but not the Lyme disease causing agents, which again will become more important when we talk about diagnostics. Um, and it's also transmitted to larva transovarially, trans making ticks both the vectors and an additional reservoir for this pathogen. Um, there have been many studies looking at the epidemiology of Borrelia miyamotoi, both in ticks and in humans. And if we start with the tick situation, it is present at fairly low levels in two main Exodes tick species in the U.S., up to about 2%, depending on what region of the U.S. you're looking at. Um, although there are pockets where tick infection rates are much higher, like in New York and interestingly, um, actually in Napa, California. In humans, though, seroprevalence studies similarly show a, um, a range, depending on region, anywhere from 1% to 10% seropositivity. Interestingly, one study showed that roughly 14% of patients with Borrelia miyamotoi infection, I believe in New York, were co-infected at some point with Borrelia burgdorferi. And then in a separate molecular epidemiologic study, uh, it showed that anywhere from 0.16 to 0.5% of acutely febrile patients, again from the Northeast US, were positive for Borrelia miyamotoi. 
So although at a, at a low rate, it is definitely a pathogen uh, that clinicians need to be aware of here in North America as it may be under, um, uh, under considered as a, a causative uh, patient of febrile illness, positive pathogen of febrile illness. Clinically, though, the symptoms of Borrelia miyamotoi infection, um, as this case showed, are fairly nonspecific and kind of influenza-like, similar to other tick-borne and non-tick-borne infections. So most patients will present with fever and chills, a severe headache and myalgias or, or even al arthralgias. Interestingly, um, in a large case series of over 50% of patients, they were initially sus suspected of having sepsis and about one quarter were, were hospitalized. Um, importantly though, this is a fairly treatable infection with doxycycline with a very high success rate and resolution um, in um, anywhere from two to seven days roughly. When it comes to diagnostics for this, there's a number of options to consider. Importantly, while blood sphere microscopy can be helpful to diagnose classic relapsing fever cases, the sensitivity of this method for detection of Borrelia miyamotoi is actually quite low. One study looked at about 20 PCR confirmed cases and found spirochetes in only two of the whole blood samples after examining 300 fields, fields of view. Um, so we really can't rely on microscopy to identify these particular cases. Molecular detection, on the other hand, is preferred for acute diagnosis, not surprisingly. There are um, no FDA cleared or approved assays for this, so the targets and performance characteristics for the few Borrelia miyamotoi PCR assays out there can be variable, but generally speaking, they are most sensitive when used within the first eight days of symptom onset when bacteremia is highest. Um, and then serologic testing is used largely to make more of a retrospective diagnosis, um, similar to molecular testing. It's also fairly limited in availability currently. These assays primarily look to detect antibodies to the GLP-Q antigen, which again is unique to the relapsing fever Borrelia. And as you can see, um, serology has low rates of positivity in cases of Lyme disease and in non-endemic blood donors. In general, though, IgM and IgG antibodies to this phosphodiesterase phosphodiesterase uh, GLP-Q really peak at about 11 to 20 and 20 to 50 days post-infection, um, respectively. A common question, though, that comes up is instead of looking for Borrelia miyamotoi-specific serologic assays, um, can we use the available Lyme two-tier testing assays as a surrogate, especially given that the treatment is the same? So to look at this one group tested acute and convalescent sera from Borrelia miyamotoi confirmed patients uh, by both ELISA and um, immunoblot assays for Lyme disease. And what they found is that the EIAs for Lyme were positive in over 90% of convalescent samples from Borrelia miyamotoi ca cases. The catch, though, was that only about 10% of those were also positive by the immunoblots. So using a standard two-tier testing algorithm, most cases of Borrelia miyamotoi would be missed. However, with the introduction of the modified two-tier testing algorithms for Lyme, which again are based on shared or, or similar antigens, um, would expect that will detect many of their Borrelia miyamotoi cases. Um, however, I haven't really seen specific uh, studies looking at this uh, as, of, as of yet. All right, so our, our next case is a 56-year-old, um, previously healthy female. Uh, she lives in Minnesota. She presented in October with a three to four day history of persistently high fevers progressive onset of um, confusion and gait instability, and she had also developed uh, this punctate maculopapular rash, as you can see on the images. On admission, she developed multiple cranial nerve symptoms, cerebral edema, um, and rapidly declined, requiring intubation and transferred to the ICU, where she was uh, placed under continuous EEG monitoring that ultimately showed evidence of two focal motor uh, seizures. An LP was performed, again, just showing you the abnormal findings, uh, included elevated protein and pleocytosis with a lymphocytic predominance. 
Um, there was no other notable information um, on her social history aside that she lives in Minnesota and smoked about a pack a day um, and she'd gone camping recently in northern Minnesota. So as you can imagine, she had an extensive workup for multiple services, including infectious diseases. And I looked, I listed um, some of the things that we looked for by PCR serology and culture. Everything was essentially negative. The team also sent out uh, plasma and CSF for metagenomic next generation sequencing, which also came back negative. And really the only non-negative result for her appeared on her arbovirus uh, antibody panel, which was performed on CSF and serum, which includes testing for these viruses listed here. And on this panel, anything more, less than one to 10 is considered negative. So you can see that everything was negative with the exception of West Nile virus, uh, for which she had equivocal IgM results in both serum and CSF. Um, so the provider reached out and basically asked whether we think this would be consistent with the West Nile virus encephalitis. So interestingly, at the time of this particular case, um, when the patient presented, there were increasing news stories in Minnesota about the emergence of a new tick-borne pathogen, uh, Powassan virus. Although I will point out that the news doesn't always get it right. So Powassan virus is a tick-borne um, transmitted infection, uh, but the image you see here circled in red is not in fact a tick. Um, regardless though, um, this got us thinking about whether this could be a possible case of Powassan because it is a flavivirus which can present similar lead to West Nile virus and it is found in Minnesota. So around this time, we were also looking at a number of Powassan virus IgM and IgG EIAs alongside a targeted PCR assay for Powassan virus. And so we decided to test this patient samples. Um, and what we found was the IgM was positive for Powassan in spinal fluid and serum, although uh, both were negative um, by the PCR assay. So we ultimately submitted this patient samples to the CDC for confirmatory testing by plaque reduction neutralization or PRNT um, and that came back a few weeks later as positive in spinal fluid for Powassan virus at a titer of 1 to 80. So this pa patient was diagnosed with Powassan virus encephalitis. So many of you may be familiar uh, with Powassan, but for, for those who are not, it is a member of the flavivirus genus, um, amongst which the vast majority of viruses are transmitted through an arthropod vector, including mosquitoes, um, which transmit things like West Nile, Zika, and Dengue, while other members of this genus are transmitted by exodes species ticks, um, most notably including Powassan virus and, and others. Um, of course, you'll remember that exodi species are also the ones that transmit Lyme, Babesia, Anaplasma, and so on. Uh, there are two lineages of Powassan virus, lineage one and lineage two, the latter of which is referred to as deer tick virus, and these are maintained in the environment uh, by different small rodent reservoirs, and, um, and they are actually transmitted by uh, different exodi species ticks, with some of which uh, much less commonly bite humans. Um, and then most notably, unlike the other tick-borne pathogens, Powassan virus can be transmitted to humans within 15 minutes of tick attachment, which is really quite rapid considering that transmission of other pathogens, including Lyme disease, takes at least about 36 hours of tick attachment. Clinically, uh, Powassan was first identified in a five-year-old boy with encephalitis from Powassan, Ontario. Uh, since then, we've learned that roughly 4 to 5 percent of Ixodes ticks carry Powassan virus, of which 50 percent are also co-infected with Borrelia uh, burgdorferi. Uh, however, due to the lack of kind of readily available diagnostics for Powassan and limited knowledge about the virus, I, I strongly think that many Powassan virus infections are likely going undiagnosed. Uh, to that point, since 2001, when Powassan became a notifiable disease, we've only seen about 160 cases that have been identified, amongst which the vast majority have been from Minnesota, Wisconsin, and New York. Uh, with respect to seropositivity um, studies through the CDC, uh, about two-thirds of those infected um, really remain asymptomatic or subclinical. Um, but for the remaining 30%, the patients will develop high fever, fatigue, headache, 
malaise, um, significant myalgia as well. And um, of those individuals, about 30% will progress to develop CNS involvement. And while some patients will eventually overcome uh, the infection and improve, about half will have long-term neurologic sequelae and about 10% will ultimately succumb to their infection. Uh, notably, there's no targeted treatment. However, diagnosis is important as it allows for empiric antibiotics to be discontinued. It also provides important prognostic information for patients and families um, alongside generally improving our understanding of the epidemiology associated with these viruses. When it comes to the diagnosis of Powassan or really any arbovirus, I'd say timing is everything and test selection really needs to be guided uh, by when the patient presents post onset of symptoms. So briefly, what this looks like for these viruses is after transmission, the incubation can be anywhere from two to 14 days, after which patients may develop symptoms. And for mo molecular assays um, to detect these these viruses, it's, they're really uh, preferred early on in presentation within the first week or so of symptoms. That's really when they're most sensitive. Also during the first week is when serologic testing um, or when the serologic response to arboviruses starts to develop. Um, the first, uh, first from IgM class antibodies followed shortly thereafter by IgG class antibodies. And so it's really this time frame after the first five to seven days of symptoms when serologic testing is most useful. So one of the reasons we still rely so heavily on antibody detection for arboviruses is because the majority of them have a fairly transient low level viremia, uh, particularly in otherwise healthy individuals who often also present later on during their disease course. And then the other reason is that in general, there are few targeted molecular assays available for some of these pathogens, including for Powassan virus. When it comes to serologic testing and serologic test results for Powassan virus, however, uh, one of the, the key really diagnostic assays and, and the, the reference standard method for detecting these antibodies or confirming uh, previous positives is to uh, perform plaque reduction neutralization testing or, um, or PRNT. Running these sorts of assays though is quite challenging and classically involves testing each serum with a number of closely related um, and co-circulating viruses. So <clears throat> in the case of our patient, her serum sample um, was ultimately sent again to the CDC as mentioned previously, and it was serially diluted and tested separately for antibodies to Powassan virus, West Nile virus, and St. Louis uh, encephalitis virus. Um, so to show you how that looks like here, we've got our three different um, viruses. They are mixed again with serial dilutions of the patient um, sample. After those dilutions are incubated, each of those mixtures is essentially overlaid on top of a susceptible cell monolayer and incubated for four to 10 days. That monolayer is then stained to look for the presence or absence of plaques. So if there's no plaques or a few plaques compared to the control, that would indicate the presence of uh, neutralizing antibodies to the virus um, and therefore prior patient infection. On the other hand, if there are plaques present, that would mean that the virus was not inactivated and that neutralizing antibodies were absent, making it less likely that the patient was previously infected. And so this is what a real PRNT plate um, actually looks like, again, where you can see the presence and absence of plaques. And then when determining which virus actually caused the infection, the endpoint titers are typically compared with the one having at least a fourfold or higher titer considered the infectious um, agent. So obviously there are many challenges associated with this method, including the fact that many of these viruses require biosafety level three facilities to culture. Um, they're, again, technically difficult and, and laborious. And so as a result, alternative surrogate neutralizing antibody assays using uh, pseudoviruses and alternative detection techniques like luminescence have been developed. Um, but from personal experience, thanks to COVID, I can say that even these assays can be challenging to run in your regular typical clinical laboratory, um, but they are available and will likely improve um, in workflow in the future. 
So um, that was that was our uh, Powassan virus case, and I should mention um, uh, that the patient unfortunately did succumb to the infection. So these are very um, uh, very challenging cases and infections to to deal with. And again, I do think that we have um, quite a bit more Powassan virus circulating than <clears throat> than is um, uh, and has been reported. So moving on to our last case for today, we have a 34 year old male who presented to the emergency department uh, with high fever, chills, myalgia, as well as anorexia. Um, and he um, indicated that he'd recently removed a tick from his abdomen after camping in Missouri. On initial workup, he was found to be thrombocytopenic, leukopenic, and had elevated ASTs. The provider had also ordered a CBC with differential, and the following was observed on his peripheral blood smear. And I hope you'll notice here um, that these are inclusions in leukocytes as um, indicated by the arrows. So the question to think about here is what is on your differential at this point and what additional laboratory testing, if any, um, would you order? So hopefully these characteristic inclusions got you thinking that maybe this could be anaplasma phagocytophilum or maybe Ehrlichia species, both of which are closely related gram-negative small intracellular uh, bacterial organisms. Despite these similarities, though, they can be differentiated from uh, one another by a number of different ways, including epidemiologic factors. Um, first, they are, for the most part, transmitted by different tick vectors with anaplasma transmitted by Ixodes species, whereas most are like here transmitted by amblyoma species. And then their main reservoirs are different as well, with anaplasma primarily maintained in the white-footed um, mouse, whereas Ehrlichia are more common in white-tailed um, deer. Uh, and then finally, they're found in different geographic regions with anaplasma distributed throughout North Central and the Northeastern US, whereas most Ehrlichia are encountered in the Central Midwest, as you can see by the dark purple states. Uh, the primary exception to this, again, is Ehrlichia muris oclarensis, which to date has only been identified in Wisconsin and Minnesota. These tick-borne pathogens can also be differentiated based on their cellular tropism, so they both replicate in parasitophorous vacuoles, which are referred to as morula, which is a Latin word for mulberry, uh, which is kind of what they look like in the cell. However, anaplasma is preferential to granulocytes, whereas Ehrlichia species prefer to infect monocytes. And while there is a single clinically relevant anaplasma species, again, there are three main Ehrlichia species in the U.S., most common of which is Ehrlichia shafiensis, followed by Ehrlichia uingii, um, uh, which notably infects granulocytes, similar to anaplasma. And then finally, again, the more recently described Ehrlichia muris oclarensis. Clinically, following infection, there can be anywhere from a five to 14 day incubation period after which patients may remain asymptomatic or may present with nonspecific flu-like symptoms. And while a rash is generally uncommon, about a third of patients with Ehrlichia may report a maculopapular rash. Also, both of these agents are uh, notable for their triad of general laboratory findings, including thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, and elevated transaminases. And while the majority of people resolve their infection, the elderly, those that are significantly immunosuppressed or have hematologic malignancies, are at risk for more severe sequelae, including, um, or I should say, although the fatality rate is still uh, quite low. When it comes to laboratory detection of these pathogens, there's a number of methods available, including um, potentially by identification of morulae on uh, routine blood smears, although this um, is really most often an incidental finding, um, and the absence of morulae really should not be used as a marker to exclude infection. Um, generally, the chances of identifying morula is highest during the first week of symptoms when anaplasma inclusions uh, in particular can be found in up to 75% of patients, but the sensitivity is much lower for Ehrlichia species, which is anywhere from 1% to 20%. Uh, the preferred detection method, though, is by molecular assays on whole blood during the acute disease stage when patients present uh, with less than about seven to 10 days of symptoms. 
primary, the primary, I should say, limitation, though, um, is that molecular testing at, currently, at least, is not widely available um, and oftentimes requires uh, send out testing. So there can be a delay in turnaround time. And then the last diagnostic method available for these um, is serologic assays, often performed by immunofluorescence assays. Generally, it takes about seven to 10 days for an infected individual to develop a robust detectable immune response. So the sensitivity of serologic testing um, is really highly dependent on the timing of specimen collection. So for example, during the acute phase of infection, you can see that sensitivity for both M and G uh, antibodies um, is extremely low, whereas during co the convalescent phase, the sensitivity is um, quite high, over 95%. Um, serology can also be used as a diagnostic if you have a single IgG titer that is greater than one to two, or greater than or equal to one to 256, or if you document seroconversion or a fourfold rise in titers. Limitations of serologic um, testing for these pathogens, though not surprisingly, um, is that they cannot be used during the acute stage of disease for diagnostics, or at least a negative result cannot be used to rule out infection. And then also these antibodies can remain positive for prolonged periods of time following resolution of the disease. Um, and then there's the issue of cross-reactivity both between each other, so between Ehrlichia and um, anaplasma, and also with uh, cross-reactivity to other intracellular pathogens, which is just something to be cognizant of. Um, and so with that, you can't really have a TikTok and not mention prevention, um, which at this point is entirely dependent on prevention of the tick bite itself. So in general, recommendations are to avoid walking in wooded, bushy, or high grass areas, and instead to walk kind of in the center of trails. Of course, uh, you'll want to use insect repellent with at least 20 to 30% DEET on exposed skin, and then you can also treat clothing with permethrin as an uh, insect repellent. And then finally, you'll want to inspect yourself for ticks after foraying into these high-risk areas. Um, and I have to say there's some pretty detailed flyers out there um, and examples that you can use um, to look and see where you should be checking for ticks. And so with that, I will um, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Thiel, for such a great and thoughtful presentation. Now we have time, 15 minutes, for some questions that we have received. And any unanswered questions will be addressed via email. Okay, so the first, I'm going to start with Borrelia burgdorferi questions. And the first question is about the CDC, CDC testing algorithm. So does the CDC testing algorithm include the detection of antibodies against Borrelia garini and Borrelia abseli? Uh, great question. It does not. So currently, um, at least in the U.S., it's very specific, or the, the standard algorithm is very specific for Borrelia burgdorferi, um, specifically because that's all that the blots will detect. They won't, they do not detect the antibodies to Borrelia garinii and Ocellii. Um, however, the modified two-tiered testing algorithm, which again is based on um, multiple EIAs, um, that uh, algorithm is much more likely to detect antibodies across the Lyme causing Borrelia um, group. But of course, it will not differentiate between Bergdorferi versus Ocellii or Gurinii. Okay, thank you. The next question is about the modified two-tier testing algorithm for Lyme. Would you suggest separate or combination of IgM and IgG testing for confirmation? Yeah, so um, right, right now you can kind of mix and match in a way, whether you have single, just a total, you know, a first and second tier total antibody assay or whether you want the second tier to be separated out into IgM and IgG. Um, personally, uh, and what we offer through our lab is uh, a separated IgM and IgG um, second tier EIAs, uh, because I think it's helpful to know what antibody class you're detecting. 
especially if all you're detecting is IgM positivity and the patient's had symptoms for, you know, two months. Um, uh, that doesn't really, you know, probably not going to go down the Lyme, um, the Lyme route at that point since we shouldn't be considering um, IgM after that time frame. So I do think it's helpful to differentiate and know exactly what antibody classes you're detecting. Great, thank you. Okay, and this is following up on the modified 2TR testing. So the question is, why do clinicians still order for order the standardized 2TR testing algorithm? And the context is that the labs must do the test the clinicians are order, and most of them they seem to be not to be aware of the modified 2TR testing. Yeah, um, great question. One that I ask myself um, not infrequently. Uh, so I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One, the modified algorithm in the US was officially approved um, by the FDA, endorsed by the CDC right before COVID hit. Um, and so I think, you know, labs were focused on other things at that time and not really working towards um, moving to a modified algorithm. Uh, so that's one. Um, for labs that have transitioned to the modified algorithm or offer both the modified and a standard version, um, like, like we do for our practice, uh, we're still not seeing a huge uptake in the modified algorithm. And I think that's largely due to individuals just being used to ordering the standard algorithm. Um, they, they like to maybe see that expansion in antibody um, banding patterns over time for the IgG. So I think it's just what clinicians have been used to. There's not been a lot of focus or emphasis on um, uh, moving clinicians maybe towards the modified algorithms. Okay, thank you. So let's move now to Lyme neuro neuroborreliosis questions. And the first question is, is the, is the rise in Lyme neuroborreliosis positivity rate happening in all endemic states or just in some of them in the US? Um, so great question. Uh, I, we, I, we have not really looked at positivity rates per state or relative to state. So I would assume that this is something that we're seeing um, across the endemic areas, uh, you know, the, at least for the United States, we really have one primary species or strain, um, but it's, it's a good question and something that would be interesting in um, pursuing whether there's a regional increase or, or not. I think the key point I wanted to make, um, at least for North America, is that we do have a significant amount of neuroinvasive Lyme disease. And I don't think that clinicians are really aware of that mm -hmm. because typically when we say neuroinvasive Lyme, I think we associate with Borrelia grinii Europe or in Euro-Asia, not necessarily North America. So I think that's something that clinicians really should be a little bit more um, familiar with. Great. Okay. And would you suggest to do a combination of PCR testing and antibody testing in the first six weeks of uh, the disease? And this question was asked during the Lyme neuroborreliosis. Sure. Um, so uh, I think one of my, my, one of my favorite si slides is that summary table of PCR sensitivity relative to uh, specimen type that's tested. So in general, um, molecular testing on spinal fluid for Lyme disease is very insensitive. Looking, you know, we offer this testing through our laboratory and looking back 10 years of testing, I think we've had one positive in spinal fluid. So I personally, um, from our experience, really do not find much value in testing for uh, Borrelia burgdorferi by PCR in spinal fluid. Got it. And what are your thoughts on measuring cytokines for Lyme neuroborreliosis detection in addition or instead of antibodies? Yeah, so you're probably referring to CXCL13, which is a B-cell chemoattractant. Um, and studies have shown that it is elevated in patients with neuroinvasive Lyme disease. And uh, notably, it declines with um, appropriate treatment and symptom resolution. So that's, that's great. 
The problem is it's not specific. It's also elevated in patients with other non-infectious diseases, um, Alzheimer's, MS, um, also in patients with neurosyphil neuroinvasive syphilis and cryptococcus. So I don't think it can be used as a, a diagnostic for Lyme, but considering that the antibody index will remain positive for prolonged periods of time, if you needed to, you could maybe measure CXCL13 and see that it declines um, in response to therapy if you were going to do serial spinal fluid collections, which so it, may not it would be, be in, would be in CSF, correct, Dr. Yes, not in CSF. Okay. Yep. Good. Yeah. And we have a question now. Uh, this is some clinician says that borreliosis is sexually transmitted. Never heard about that. That's what one of our mm -hmm. uh, attendees is saying. Is there something true about this? Are you familiar with this? Um, yeah, I think there have been some interesting discussions about, you know, Lyme in general is a controversial topic, right? And this has been posed in the past. Is it a sexually transmitted? disease. From my reading, my understanding, it is not, um, it is not sexually transmitted uh, from, from what I have read. Okay, great, perfect. And now let's move to questions about Powassan. Mm. So when, when would you test for Powassan virus infection? In patients with encephalitis symptoms or patients that have been exposed to ticks? Um, so, so good question. I probably, so I would not recommend testing um, for Powassan or really any other tick-borne disease just if you've been exposed to ticks, right? Because many of these infections, including Powassan, can be entirely asymptomatic, right? In about two-thirds of people, it's asymptomatic. There's also no treatment for Powassan. So even if you were to confirm infection, you're not really going to do too much about it. Um, other than monitor potentially for symptoms. So really for testing, strongly recommend to only test those that have symptoms of neuroinvasive um, infection or systemic infection. Um, and also importantly, those who have been to endemic areas uh, mm -hmm. for Powassan specifically. Um, so in those cases, yes, uh, testing, but not asymptomatic assessment. Okay. Great, thank you. And also in your slides, you presented about PRNT, plaque re reduction neutralization test. And we had a question about other assays, serological assays. So are current serological tests capable of detecting both POAS and virus lineages? Mm -hmm. uh, great question. Um, so if you look at the sequence, the protein sequence homology um, between the proteins, it's about, um, it's fairly similar. I think they differ four to six percent. Uh, so when thinking about serologic assays, it's highly likely that they will cross-react and detect antibodies to TBE and lineage one and lineage two. Um, however, has that been shown, uh, you know, in peer-reviewed literature? No, um, it, it has not. Uh, but based on sequence homology, I would say that there's a very high likelihood that we would see cross-reactivity. Thank you. And this question is more about co-infections. So you mm. describe co-infection of Borrelia burdoferi and Miyamotai. How prevalent are other co-infections from different tick-borne diseases? Yeah, so um, it kind of varies from region to region. I'd say uh, with anaplasma and Lyme, I think they're um, a couple studies showing that up to 10% of individuals um, that were tested from the Northeast United States uh, can are, have been shown to be co-infected. Uh, so I think it, it kind of varies on region um, uh, and obviously uh, tick populations, but it is possible. I'd say anywhere from one to maybe a maximum of 10% of individuals may have co-infection. Um, so for that reason, you know, it, it makes sense to offer um, diagnostic testing in panels uh, using panels. Um, so from, from a laboratory perspective, you know, it would make sense to offer uh, panel testing, both molecular and serologic. Great. And now we have time for one more question. So the question is about T-cell response. Mm -hmm. 
So is cellular immune response these cells also important for the diagnosis of Lyme disease? Um, good question. So yes, they do definitely play a role in the disease process and in disease resolution. The question is, should we be testing for that response? Um, and there have been some interferon gamma release assays that have been developed to look for interferon gamma release in response to Lyme um, disease proteins. I think the, the problem is, uh, frankly, that they have not been really shown to work well and to significantly improve upon or, or provide better accuracy and sensitivity over serologic testing. Um, and these assays in general are difficult to run. They require fresh whole blood. There's a whole you know, multi-day uh, uh, processing um, and testing process. So it's not that workflow issue from the lab perspective, as well as the not great um, uh, performance data that has been published really make it um, an assay that I haven't been too excited to bring into the lab. Not to say that they may not improve in the future, of course. Mm -hmm. So we will need to wait to better understand the utility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, great. So thank you very much, Dr. Phil. It was a pleasure to have you thank today you. as a speaker. Thank you. And thank you thank very much. You. Great. And thank you all of you for joining us today. We will have the next infectious diseases disease webinar in November. So stay tuned to learn more about that. And thank you.